Hi folks, I'm Jen Schleter, Dean of Graduate Studies here at Columbus College of Art and Design, a nonprofit art and design college that has been a creative force within Central Ohio for more than 140 years. Um, welcome to today's event, Creating Places for People. We're here because now is a pivotal time in retail and there are none better set than the creative and resourceful minds at CCAD to examine and solve the many challenges in this evolving field. And as part of that work, we've launched a nine part online lecture series, CCAD Knows Retail, featuring industry leaders who are gonna share their insight about the retail landscape and what is on its horizon. Before we jump into today's talk and I introduce our speaker, I just wanna share a few housekeeping notes. We are recording today's talk so that we can share it on our website for those who aren't able to join us. Today's event is in a webinar format and all lines are muted and videos are off other than for the speakers. We will have time to answer your questions at the end. So please, please feel free to use the Q&A function throughout the discussion to submit questions as they come to you. And you are also welcome to use the chat function throughout to share any reactions or comments. Now, I am really excited to introduce today's speaker. Brian is a co-founder and the leader of Creative Visioning at Realm Collaborative, a highly innovative group of urbanists, designers, and storytellers. He brings a wealth of knowledge to the development of complex sites. Passionate about urban design, he has worked with both private developers and institutional entities, leading clients to maximize their land value while creating enriching public spaces. Leading multidisciplinary teams, Brian has established an expertise in setting bold visions for clients where his work is driven by the belief that public space can do more to shape our experiences and bring greater value to owners. His work includes mixed use commercial, institutional, hospitality, and resort design, and geographically spans the US, Mexico, Russia, and India. Please welcome me in, please join me in welcoming Brian. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, so much for having me. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to participate in this wonderful group and uh, to share with you all today uh, something that's truly passionate uh, for me uh, and something that I hope uh, you will find uh, inspiring for yourselves as you consider a, a career in, in retail design and, and particularly um, in light of sort of the way the world is right now and how we think about public space. Uh, so with that, let me see if I can do the sh screen share here. Okay. Um, so, as uh, Jennifer so kindly introduced, uh, I am a co-founder of Realm. Uh, we are a design firm that has a strong belief in the um, shaping of public space for the better. And really what uh, I mean by that is that our belief is that the, pub the built environment can really facilitate more interactions and really impact the culture positively to the way we live within our communities. Um, and so, it should really come as no surprise that what we're passionate about our cities and particularly the public spaces, the public realm, the things that really glue all of our spaces and buildings together in those cities. Um, a gentleman who we greatly admire and who I'll talk about a little bit has this wonderful quote that says, a good city is like a good party. People stay longer than really necessary because they're enjoying themselves. And I think uh, we, we couldn't help but find that more true in sort of the work we do, which is really trying to attract people to a place, get them to stay longer, enjoy themselves, uh, and really build a, a sense of community that, that we've in the last sort of 40 or 50 years in some ways lost touch with and are now coming back to. Uh, this is a, a photo of uh, myself, my lovely fiance uh, in Rio de Janeiro uh, a couple years ago. And we had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, one of the most liveliest street parties I've ever been to. Uh, th there are vendors, there's samba music, uh, and really most of these people are from the neighborhood. Um, surprisingly enough, uh, this is not something that happens once a quarter, once a year. This happens Monday and Friday nights uh, uh, every week. And so this place is serving uh, as this sort of you know, cultural destination for them, but this community centric destination for them on a weekly basis. Ironically, uh, it's, it's also, you know, built on this side of a, a, a protruding rock form that was the community was built around. And so it has this incredibly unique and distinct quality to it. 
Uh, the reason I, I shared this is because it was really the first time for me that I, I understood this, this concept we at Realm call the power of people in place. And really what I'd love to do today is, is share with you why I think that's so important and why I think we need more of that uh, in the way we design the, the spaces, particularly in retail, uh, that we create today. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, some of the things that we're dealing with today is uh, technology. Um, we've never been closer in some ways because we could connect with people, uh, but in other ways, it's, it's in some ways pulling us apart. You can dial up anything you want in a moment's notice and, and really never have to leave your home. Uh, and even with the pandemic, now we're working from home uh, more. And so um, one of the, the questions, you know, I think a lot of people are asking themselves, why do these places matter anymore? Why do I need to go somewhere? What is the interest in creating, you know, public space? Um, and really what I would like to argue and, and, and convince you of is that it's really about creating a sense of community. I think a lot of people talk about the experience and the enriching nature of places. Um, but ultimately for me, I think it, it adds up to the sense that we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And, and it's actually something we need. And so I want to tell you a story today about uh, this gentleman, Brett Kaufman. Uh, some of you may know if you live in the Columbus area and if you don't. Uh, Brett is a visionary. Uh, Brett is a real estate developer, and uh, Brett started asking some really interesting questions. Uh, instead of being like the rest of his field, in some ways, that was just developing buildings to uh, sort of based on economic measures that are, are very uh, typical, Brett set out to create a community. He really wanted to do something that would um, impact people's lives and really bring them closer together. And so that development, which is just outside of downtown Columbus here, just over the river, is called the Gravity Project. Uh, and in that, uh, Brett really sought to not only design the building differently to engage, create engaging spaces, uh, incorporating you know, iconic artwork on part of the buildings, uh, but he also started to incorporate really that strong sense of community, that place that pulls people together. Uh, you know, the amenities in this space go beyond sort of the baseline. They incorporate a coffee shop, a co-working space, uh, a gym, uh, and a brewery. And so all of these things sort of, you know, compiled together uh, really start to make people, you know, interact and, and move around the building itself. Um, I might be slightly biased here because I do happen to live there. So that's me in the, the, the right with my fiance. Um, but they take this one step further by programming the building by um, having events for people to come together and share in the courtyard. And even furthermore, they go beyond and donate and, and volunteer time back to the community uh, that uh, in of which gravity is based in. Uh, and so Brett really has, has taken his vision and is living out that vision uh, in, in really one of the most authentic ways and really starting to create that sense of community. Um, in some ways, I'd say he's doubling down. This is his second phase, which uh, proud to say we are a part of. This is our, our design here for one of the courtyards in the project. Um, but as I thought about putting this presentation together and sharing with you all, you know, what I think is important, you know, really what Brett is doing is in some ways not too dissimilar to the way we used to live in cities. Um, you know, back before the, you know, really in some ways before the automobile, um, you know, and there was good and bad about this, but in some ways it forced us to um, rub shoulders with other people, to connect, to have a sense of community um, that, you know, and it was sort of innate in, in these neighborhoods and these villages that we lived in. You know, and along came, you know, transit that allowed us to, you know, share space and, and connect with other people, even while riding, you know, a trolley to a, a different part of town. And as I mentioned, we would sit next to complete strangers on a bench uh, and, you know, in some ways, maybe you didn't talk to them, but you still felt a part of something. I think if you probably asked anybody who has lived in New York City, they would they would tell you that that sense of community is sort of innate and sort of um, uh, bred into the, the place itself. And so uh, I want to go a little bit deeper. I wanted to talk about the two things, people and place, and I want to start with place. Uh, the car was really great. It allowed us a ton of freedom. Uh, it's made it easier to connect to different places. And, and uh, I think there's a lot of good things that can be said about it. But in some ways, um, it really started to segregate us, to divide us, to pull us apart. Um, we 
not only segregated each other's in some way, we segregated our, our communities. We created uh, homes with next to homes. We created offices next to offices. Uh, no longer were we intermixed in these types of uses and creating that need, that ability to walk to places because we could drive to places. And when you drive to a place, uh, you have to park your car somewhere. And so we started to spread ourselves out and we created you know, retail centers. Uh, we went even further to create the idea of this, this uh, thing we call a mall. And ironically enough, the mall was envisioned originally um, to be sort of this replication of a, uh, a European type space where it was very pedestrian oriented. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that has been cannibalized over the years. And what malls really became were these sort of isolated islands uh, that you drove to, that you went in, you got immersed into. And I'm sure we all have great stories about going to the food court in the mall and, and, and that part of our lives, but it didn't really add to the sense of vitality and culture and uh, uh, the things that we got out of, of more of our traditional neighborhood centers and, and cities. And then we took it even further and started adding more parking lots and more strip centers. And uh, I think one of the things I love about this photo is that the here we were lining up a series of, of retail stores. And then the, the movie theater is sort of across behind and, and not even facing the river that, that it's adjacent to. And so everything was very car centric. Uh, and it, it spread us apart. And really in some ways it left us with, with very little, if any, if no sense of community, uh, particularly when retail would change or things would move on. And then in about 1980s, uh, a group of very astute architects, planners, uh, landscape architects came together and really challenged uh, uh, the notion of, of how we were designing our places. Could we, could we do better? Um, I apologize, this graphic's a little bit blurry here, but on the left is you know, maybe what was more of the traditionally accepted notion at the time, accommodate for the car. Uh, and what they started to do was bring us back to the way cities were, were designed before and accommodate the car in a new way, you know, parking garages, tuck behind, uh, allow for a variety of different retail types, but also mixing uh, residential office uh, retail together, creating sort of that, that vitality and vibrancy that, that we had had, you know, in our, our places. This was Celebration Florida or is Celebration Florida. It was one of the first ones that was completed on, on this new sort of premise and you can see that they were focusing more on, on creating streets, more walkability, more mix of uses, uh, retail on the bottom, residential above, office above. Uh, I can't help but not mention Easton. You had um, uh, Jennifer Pe Peterson from Steiner present the last round of these, and um, they have done a tremendous job, if not one of the, the more leading visionary jobs of creating these types of places today. Uh, and so you can see that it's no longer, while this is mostly a retail destination, uh, it's very curated around place and around bringing people together, uh, giving them a reason to come, uh, not just for the shopping, but to entertain and, and, and dine. And so you can see, you know, putting a fountain, uh, you know, in the middle and bringing your kid there for the afternoon uh, and then having lunch, you know, adjacent to that. And so these things are drawing us back to that, that thing that we all crave, this idea of of spending more time doing things with our lives uh, that have a different sort of mix. Uh, simultaneously, at the same time, we've uh, started to pull ourselves back to cities. Uh, this is the short north here in Columbus, which has seen an extreme resurgence of vitality in, in life in the last, you know, 10, 20 years here. Uh, and it's, you know, um, become this uh, mix of destinations of, of restaurants, of galleries, of artistry, uh, um, in retail and shopping, uh, even more is sort of the programming, the placemaking that occurs as part of that and, and the vibrancy that is offered. And so, um, you know, as I sort of round out the, the place portion here, I, I think it's important for us, and I think really what I'm driving at is that as we grow, as we come back to realizing what we need uh, and how we design these places, you know, are we thinking hard enough about the place what is really sort of the attraction that brings us together in, in both of these two kind of different types of destinations? Are we creating the culture that we need, the vibrancy, the diversity of, of people and places, uh, and ultimately trying to create that sense of community that, that I think we need now more than ever uh, when you consider sort of the way technology, uh, the pandemic uh, has changed a bit of our human behavior. 
And so uh, I wanted to also focus on place and how we design these places. Um, as I mentioned the quote in the beginning, Jan Gell is a, uh, a Danish architect and researcher who has done a tremendous job of helping communities and, and really the world in a way better understand the social quality of why we love uh, these, these, these dense places and how do we recreate them in some ways. Uh, one of the things we're really fond of is particularly his approach. He, he has a quote, he says, life, space, and buildings, never the other way around. And the irony of that is that I think so often when we create places, it's so easy to start in some ways in America with parking. Well, where's the parking and where are the buildings? And the last thing we start to think about is, is how do we create the life and the vibrancy? And when you flip that model and think of it differently, you really begin to you really begin to challenge and ask harder questions about what really attracts people and how do we get them to stay? And so he breaks down pedestrian activities into attracting people into sort of three different ways. First, you must accommodate the necessary. Uh, those are the things like walking, waiting for the bus, uh, the things that we need to connect from place to place. And then we add the optional, uh, you know, when the climate is correct and the sun is out, you know, where are the places that we sit and enjoy, uh, start to choose to linger. And if you can get both of those right, then the fruit of, of that combination is really the social. And that's really where you start to bring people together. And so, you know, just to reinforce that point, there's a, a typical street, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, looks amazing. There's retail, there's walkability. Um, but if you start to add these, these little elements, which seem so sort of inconsequential in our mind's eyes, but adding a place for someone to sit, uh, you start to get people to sit together, to pull together. And when you start to combine these, you add more people. And ultimately, you create this place, this attraction uh, that is you know, particularly something we're so fond of when we go to European cities that um, perhaps, you know, were developed under a different time and place, um, but they've held um, very, you know, near and dear to those sort of qualities that they love about their urban spaces. I can't help but also uh, sort of add to that, which is, you know, what the pandemic has done. Um, we have in some ways taken back over our streets uh, and, and really what I believe is, is a really healthy and good way. And so it's, it's allowed a lot of people to experience, you know, the, the quality of these spaces, really the potential of these spaces that we've in so many years sort of rededicated back to the car. Can we now start to reframe that and dedicate it back to pedestrians? Uh, this was literally this Tuesday uh, where my fiance and I and friends had dinner sitting in the short north here in Columbus. Uh, they've created the temporary sort of patio extensions that have pushed into where the parallel parking goes in the street. Uh, the vibrancy and the life that it is adding to these streets is really uh, unquestionable. And uh, I, I hope to see that we recognize this as an opportunity to really shift the, the needle from, from trying to so hard to accommodate the car to trying harder to really create these places that will attract us and, and, and that we choose to go and experience. Um, you can imagine, this is a project that I love. This is actually one that Jan Gell has designed. Uh, and uh, this is the before photo at the top and the, and the after photo at the bottom. And really you can tell the complete shift from extremely car centric to really extremely pedestrian centric. Um, and when you think about it, if you look at this photo I love, which is there's so many um, different, you know, people gathering, the seating, uh, the, the balcony even there that exists off to the left, you know, looking down over the street and the quality of life that that starts to attract um, that we, you know, we don't so often think about. But even more so, uh, it accommodates the car still uh, and it allows for some of that accessibility to happen when, when you know, perhaps it's not Saturday and Sunday uh, and it needs more of a, a Monday through Friday type of, of thing. And there's a lot of subtleties here that are happening uh, without sort of, you know, in some ways that monumental shift, um, you know, from going completely car free. And so uh, the last really two things I wanted to share with you today is, is how we deal with this, how we look at projects. Um, you know, particularly in America, I think more so than anywhere we, as I mentioned, we start with the car. Uh, this is a, a project with one of our best clients uh, that was starting to look at how we, they could create this retail destination. Um, and they understand, they know that they must accommodate the car. 
but we were trying to challenge that notion. We were trying to say, how do you, how do you be, instead of being so car centric, how do you become more pedestrian? How do we find that opportunity to share more spaces? And we started to look at, you know, these European spaces that we're so inspired by where they, they do a much better, you know, blending of this to create more flexibility. Sometimes we even throw out really crazy ideas that say, well, maybe we turn this entire place into a big piazza, an Italian piazza uh, that serves to accommodate people on the weekends and uh, can accommodate cars on the weekdays. Maybe that one was a little aggressive here for, for, our ta for the, the American taste and sort of how we would do things or maybe a little ahead of its time. Um, and so we always sort of adapt. We find new ways to think about things. We uh, looked at the idea of, could we make this a, more of a street? Yeah, could we widen the sidewalks? Could we create a promenade? And is anything we, we ultimately end up with sort of a, a combination of these ideas? Uh, and this is what you're starting to see here. So um, the strategy in some ways is relatively simple. You know, how do you accommodate this car? How do you extend the pedestrian experience? So here, looking at what would have been sort of the normal uh, sidewalk uh, that happens by simply extending the pavement, flushing out curbs, adding bollards, you know, we add a, a flexibility, not only for sort of the car, but to add different set, a series of programming to extend the pedestrian space, uh, you know, into that, that parking space that, uh, you know, may not be, that may be more valuable to curate program on during the weekends than it might be during the day. Uh, here's the another space that was at the end of the project where uh, it was it was the gathering space. It was already adding, you know, to that that quality of life where you could come and extend. Uh, but we wanted to take it further. You know, why why have everything um, in the front just dedicated to the car? Why not arrive at a plaza that just so happens to accommodate the car? And how do we extend that en enriching environment and add to that quality of of experience? And so this is. Some of those photos here at the end that show, you know, even to the point we could accommodate an ice skating rink in the winter and, and make it more flexible. And so a lot of this is about reframing our perspective, starting from the from the perspective of the experience and then layering in the, the various um, pragmatic needs like the parking. And the last project I wanted to share with you um, was is, is highly retail centric. This is the same client for us. Um, that had a project in Hilldale, um, or in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm giving you a little bit of a glimpse about how we tell our story, about how we try to convey uh, the, the quality of the project and the place. Um, and as we are talking about today, uh, we, we very much start with that notion of people and place. How do we make that happen? Uh, one of the, the comments they had told us about this, this project is they wanted to be a little bit more clever, cool, and comfortable. How do we, you know, add to the, the uniqueness of this? And so uh, the interesting thing is that this project actually used to be a mall. Uh, at some point here um, in the not too distant past, the roof was essentially ripped off the mall and it was turned into an outward facing main street. Um, the portion of the project that we're going to look at here is this orange strip in the middle, which really was a pedestrian space. Uh, in, in, in its former day, it was interior space. Now it was an exterior space. <clears throat> but the client was having a challenge. Uh, people were cutting through the space to get to parking, but the, they were not staying. They weren't lingering. And so the retail, the, the, the leasing part of this project was really um, was failing. Uh, they couldn't get people to go into the middle. And so they challenged us to, to solve this problem. And so we went through a, a series of, of you know, research and precedent and tried to help um, understand the opportunity that, that was there. Um, the space really existed for a lot of what, we, what I talked about earlier was the necessary. You could cut through it. And, and in fact, in so much, you could cut through so easily, uh, there was no real reason to stop in this place. It was hot. Um, and it just didn't have much of an attraction. And we looked at, you know, places throughout the world um, that do a much, you know, more interesting job of trying to get to, to create that granularity, that place where uh, you want to linger, that you don't necessarily want to cut through so fast. And so in a way, we really um, started to flip the diagram. We started to talk about how you create a destination. Why would I, why would I wanna go down this space? What, what am I gonna hit in the middle that, that makes me wanna draw me to this, this particular location? Um, how could we give it a story? How do we add more layers of, in some ways I'll, I 
the word overused authenticity, but how do you add something that's more uh, of that place, something that that has a you know particular architectural interest, uh, and in some ways, how do we how do we blur the lines between the interior and the exterior? And I know often in our, our retail environments, we have a lot to deal with with tenant you know leasing obligations and uh, storefronts, uh, but you know when you look at back at some of the the, the best places in Europe there's this blurry line that occurs that you, in some ways you don't know where the store begins and, and the public space begins. And that type of, of granularity is really where we love to live and start to try to innovate within. And so we did a series of, of concepts uh, to try to develop you know, what is possible here, all in the vein of trying to maximize more of these optional places. You know, how do we create more of the lingering? How do we create sort of these, um, you know, the fireplace, the seating, the trees to provide shade? Uh, you know, how do we create a bigger story? Could it become a food hall in the middle where there's a unique, you know, um, uh, retail tenant that, that creates that destination? And so while we go through a lot of design work, I'm really uh, proud to say that we took this space from, you know, really had, it was pretty lifeless uh, to something that is now much more vibrant. And, you know, while it feels maybe not necessarily revolutionary in, in what it, it's doing, there are a lot of particular layers that help uh, attract the people to this place and offering that that variety of seating, the different types of, of ways I could sit on a bench or I could sit at a table or I could move my chair into the sun or move my chair into the shade. Um, all of those little things are what we as human beings, you know, we really love and it's what keeps us going and keeps us attracting to a place. And I would say the mark of any great project is that if you can get the dogs to love it, then you're, you're doing pretty well. Um, so with that, uh, I, I offer just really sort of three things. I think that place really matters. Um, it, it really creates that sense of community. I think it's gonna be even more important as we move forward, uh, you know, with, in light of e-commerce, in light of um, you know, the ability to have more flexibility as to where we can work today. So we're gonna have to compete harder as we create retail destinations, as we create um, our urban centers to really attract people and make it a comfortable space for them to be. And I think we really need to think more granular about designing for people. Uh, about creating all of those different layers. And when you think about it, it takes a lot more thought to think about those things uh, than it does to just, you know, in some ways solve so easily for the car. And the last thing I offer is design it like a party uh, because ultimately, you know, we really want people to stay. We want it to create a place that, uh, that they will linger and be a part of. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, uh, make it like a party and make sure the dogs can come and we're there, right? We're there. I want to start this off by asking um, some questions about what happens after you've designed a space. You've sort of conceptualized it, you've worked with the client, the space is um, out there in front of us to use. Does your firm get to go back and sort of revisit and assess and shift or as the sort of use of the space evolves, or is it a sort of event in which you make it and you see what it fills up with? Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, uh, all of the, I would say they're all experiments. And I think that you're, you're asking the right question, which is, it is highly important to go back and see how these things are working. And in fact, um, probably um, the operators, you know, of these these spaces are have some of the most acute knowledge about what's working and what's not working. And so, for us to get that feedback is important because, um, you know, places so like the project in Madison that I shared, you know, they have long winters. Uh, you know, so how do you activate that space in the winter? Even here in Easton, I, I'm sure you know you find ways to try to draw people outside and create something. So, uh, I would largely answer that in, in there's a lot of need for some flexibility and in, in sometimes not providing so much permanency in how we design it, but allow it to be flexible, allow it to change with the culture and the, and the way that people want to use it. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a question coming in here from one of our participants that um, they say that they are organizing a children's museum in Yellow Springs, and they're wondering about your thoughts on projects that are rethinking educational spaces. So a sort of step to the right, let's say, of retail. Uh, wow, interesting question. Um, you know, uh, 
I'll say that I, I've uh, I've not had the the pleasure of, of designing something you know solely focused on education, but I, truthfully, I think we can learn a lot from from kids. I, we were just looking at a project for uh, a children's um, place or a, uh, what do you call it? playground, and you know through our research, I think the interesting thing is, you know there's a concept of what they call adventure playgrounds where we where kids would go and play with rocks and hammers and wood and forts and build things and they were learning and uh, there was this this idea that even having a little sense of danger and projects is good for kids uh, where in some ways we've over sanitized um, playgrounds to be so safe that we've lost that concept of exploration the things that I think as kids uh, is so vital to their development and so I would probably challenge the notion that um, what looks to be, you know, the guaranteed safe, cool neon play structure is probably not offering the, the experience that really attracts kids. That's totally fascinating. All right, now there's one in the chat here that um, is asking how you and your firm do research for how people will interact with the space and also what the residents or community really needs or wants. <clears throat> um, so for us in research, I think one is just being on the site, um, you know, particularly if it's an existing place, uh, you know, you cannot underestimate the value of, of just observing, just kind of being a casual observer, um, sitting there for an hour and watching people and how they use the space uh, as it exists. Um, you know, in other projects where we're completely designing something new. Uh, I think that's why we focus so much on trying to understand human behavior and look at people like Jan Gell and who've done the research, who, who um, have sort of broken it down into its necessary pieces. Um, you know, and I think we try to um, stay away from getting into, you know, what just the aesthetics are first. It's so easy to look at something and say, do you like it or do you not? Our question we ask ourselves is, is it going to work? Is it really going to attract people first? Um, and so that's, I think that's how we are approaching our, our research. I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question? And, and is, how do you know what the residents or communities really need or want? Uh, also a very timely question. So um, there's great technology out there today. And, I, and actually I'll, I'll add to that in the pandemic has, has added to this where typically in our field, you would go and have a community meeting and you would try to ask residents to come attend, um, you know, an event at, you know, someplace that we would hold it. The problem is, is that not everybody can attend at that time. Uh, and, and so what the pandemic has done through particularly this media format of, of webinars has allowed our industry to engage a lot more people who can get on this, add their comments, give us a better understanding of really how the place is designed or how what the problems are with the space uh, and allow us to better understand both the constraints and the opportunities from somebody who actually might live there uh, versus us just coming in and saying, oh, you know, we know this, we know how to complete this, you know, better than anyone. No, really, the truth is the people who know it better are the people who live there. Um, and so this, I think the, the pandemic for, for all its ills has actually created uh, much more connectivity to, to people who live in places. It must be a complex dance in a way between the, the needs and desires of the client, the needs and desires of the extant community, especially when they might be pulling against each other. And it feels like the work that you do needs to sort of mm, like dance with the notion of gentrification a little bit. How do you, how do you grapple with that? Um, I think that may be part of what's embedded in, in this question too. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very great question. It's a uh, complex question. Uh, I think there are, you know, uh, a lot of, of different answers. I would, I would, suggest that that perhaps we as a community need to be more forward thinking in how we plan and um, develop our communities and how are we accommodating for um, you know various types of housing um, building policy in place that does you know that allows for different um, um, levels of, of cost of living to occur in the same neighborhood uh, instead of just simply, you know, letting it be free and, and happening at will. And so I think we have to be more intentional about, um, about how we bring, stitch our, our cities back together and, and um, think about, you know, unfortunately in America, uh, because we're so car dependent and because we spread out, you know, we've not created the infrastructure to make it easy to connect to um, places of workplace easily. And so I think we have to, you know, um, think about those things. How do we get people closer to where they work? Uh, how do we make it easier to get there and not make it so car dependent? And so, uh, 
some great questions, very timely and relevant questions that, um, that we definitely need to be incorporating. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic answer to that. And I, um, there's another question coming in that's, I think, related to thinking about um, how these sort of spaces can be um, made to be inclusive of people with disabilities, for example, how that sort of filters into your thinking and your firm's thinking when you're doing the work. You know, for us, that's just baseline. I think, uh, you know, we, um, in everything that we do, you know, we, we have to accommodate that accessibility. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you design a, a set of stairs, I think for us, we, we try to take it further is we're not trying to just accept that we must create an accessible ramp. I think we're trying to create that holistically into the design uh, and, 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 you know, prevent from creating scenarios that would make it feel like there's a this or a that, uh, that it feels like one place. Uh, and I think that's, you know, as, as our profession, I think has had that opportunity to really think um, more holistically about how you create those places that accommodate everyone. Right on. Um, so this, this relates, I think, to the question of accessibility sort of broadly construed. Um, the questioner is wondering if you or your clients are seeing a trend towards reduced parking needs for retail due to things like rideshare platforms or maybe like enhanced investment in public transportation. And are your forward thinking clients actually planning for the inevitability of autonomous vehicles to reduce parking and prioritize people spaces? This is an excellent question. Uh, so when I shared the, the, one of the first project I shared that we did, uh, that was, you know, sort of in our, our foresight of saying, you know, look, you're not going to need this much parking in the future. Uh, so how can we make, how can we design it today to be flexible so that when, you know, perhaps things shift more quickly than we anticipate, uh, that you can simply just, you know, push the planters out and now you've got a 20 foot sidewalk, uh, instead of, you know, a 10 foot sidewalk. So it's relevant and it's definitely something we're thinking about. I would, I would say that probably in particularly more in urban projects, um, what's becoming of critical importance is sort of um, curb space. Uh, where do I, where does the Uber, where does the Lyft, where does, you know, mobility drop me off? Um, because that's now becoming, you know, a premium. I want to get dropped off by the front door. And in the same time, we want to create that, that patio outside the front door, um, you know, to, to make that place. Um, and so that, that sort of um, multiple flexibility that, that occurs. Columbus, um, I'm not intimately familiar with it, but Columbus has been prototyping a number of, of ways to uh, create sort of drop-off zones um, that you know, are more flexible for Amazon, for other things to occur. So I think the innovation is there, it's occurring, and uh, we're definitely considering sort of you know, what you design today, how you're not sort of avoiding um, you know, what's coming in the future. Do you find that with your clients that there is sort of advocacy for you and your firm to do around this kind of thinking uh, to sort of nudge them to really conceive of it? Um, and can you maybe give an example of how that might unfold? In as related to the mobility? Yeah, question. yeah. Or like even where there are places where you're thinking about a future and the client is thinking about a present, you know? You know, it's a, um, I, I think, in everything that we're doing, and it was kind of why I started to say with our belief is that our belief is that uh, these pedestrian spaces, the designing for the people is where we must start from. And if we can get that and we can get a shared belief around that that's important, uh, then we can find innovative ways to incorporate some of the necessities. Uh, and again, I, I don't think this is revolutionary. If you look at Europe, you look at what they've done, Culturally, they've shifted the notion that, you know, and you can have a car and a pedestrian occupy the same space. And in fact, uh, you know, um, cars go slower when there's less curb and they know that there are people around. And so we, it's kind of counter to intuitive, you know, we think if we add curbs and we add all the signage uh, that, that we're safer in reality, what it's done is allowed people to say, no, you can go 45 right down the middle of the street. Uh, and, and instead of slowing down and watching for people crossing. And so um, I really think that the, the innovation is, is a cultural shift, uh, a prioritization from away from sort of so heavily engineered and more, more an understanding sort of, you know, the experience and, and what it is, is as someone who's as an average five foot six, you know, how, how does it feel like to be in that space? Can, can you talk a little bit about how you might work with uh, a retail designer or the design of a retail space um, in this kind of work or how, how you might ideally do that work? 
um, I think that for a lot of the reasons, the parallels that we're seeing today is that we're really recreating, really creating little villages in some ways. Uh, and, you know, some uh, that the best ones are not only thinking about the immediate of, of retail, um, but they're thinking about, you know, the, the life that you create. And so having the mix of uses, having that, you know, there's the notion of the 24 hour, 24 seven city, uh, you know, where things are happening at all times of the day. Uh, and so one, from a planning perspective, I think it's, it's considering the mix of uses and, and, and what will create that vibrancy. Um, two, I, I do really think that where we probably have to lean in a little bit harder is uh, how, how do we, I, I call it curating and programming. There's the hardware, which is the physical space that we have to design. And then there's the software. Uh, I think Easton in particular, and what I was mentioning at Gravity has, you know, they're going the extra mile. They're programming the space. They're giving people a reason to come and pull together. I mean, we just unfortunately don't always have the density here in America to make a lot of those things happen by happenstance. And so we have to, we have to go the extra mile. We have to be much more intentional about sort of how do you activate that? Yeah, thank you. Um, how does weather or climate in the areas you are working on affect your design? Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's funny. I was walking in this morning. Uh, it's pouring out here. And uh, I there's a construction project on my way into work that's been there for three or four years. And they built uh, the thing over the sidewalk. And I couldn't wait to get to that moment. And it might have been 100 feet that I got to walk underneath that canopy. Uh, but it's, you know, for the, for the climate for today, it was, it was wonderful. And I think the um, challenge that we um, are always pushing back to is that when we design our buildings uh, or, or even the place, you know, how are we thinking about all those things? How are we thinking about how do you extend the season? How do you make it longer? How do you just accommodate the fact that someone, you know, it's, it's much more comfortable to walk under a canopy uh, than it is to walk against a 20 story building that has no sort of sense of scale next to it. Um, and, you know, even in the colder climates, I, I think, uh, you know, I had heard a stat that, yes, perhaps in a, the winter months when it's super cold, there's less people attending, but the second it gets above, you know, 40, you know, at, w everybody comes back out again. And so, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think we're just getting back to adapting a little bit to, uh, to that lifestyle of, of urban spaces. I love it. Um, this questioner is asking, from your perspective, does the creation of these kind of spaces for people come more from your desire or the client's desire to supply a need or from creating sort of something out of nothing for a creative architectural purpose? Uh, you know, I, I've been practicing for 20 years. When I first caught into the profession, which was right when you know that that new urbanistic mindset was happening and i think it was a it was coming from the design side and some developers were picking up on it some cities were picking up on it today i think we are all collectively much more aware uh the importance of of designing you know pulling the buildings to the street putting the parking behind accommodating some flexible parking in the front where i where we see uh, where we're probably pushing uh you know back to our clients is getting much more granular and uh, dedicating more space to the experience than uh, just simply saying, well, look, we built, pulled the building up the street, we have a sidewalk, we put a tree there, you're good. And I think we're saying there's a lot more layers to it that there's more to it that meets the eye. And if we can you know, put our emphasis on that and get people to stay longer, um, you know, ultimately then we're, we're more um, um, apt to shop and you know, uh, go to a restaurant. I love it. Uh, this last question that's coming in right now, um, I'm really glad I asked it because I too was looking at your all the places you've been on the globe and wondering how you have satisfied your obvious love for travel in the past year, staying at home. For somebody who designs places for people, what are you doing during this time? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I I will say this. Uh, we the photo I shared from Tuesday was one of the first times that we've been sitting out, you know, really um, a little bit more comfortably in a public space. And it felt amazing. It actually felt, I was remembering back to being in Paris and, and it felt like that to a degree. And, and so I think for a lot of us, as we kind of reconnect back to the world, I hope we remember and share, you know, and recognize 
the things that make us feel really great in these, these kind of environments and push harder to have more of them. Um, because it, in some ways it was easy to take it for granted, that, you know, some things that we had, you know, prior. So I don't know if I answered the question very well, but uh, uh, I'm surely happy to be back out uh, in the world a little bit more. Absolutely. I mean, I would think for sure for someone who deals with outdoor space as the sort of core of what you're passionate about, that, that this must have been a fallow time or maybe an opportunity to sort of really dig in on what you imagine for the future, yeah? Well, the other thing I'll add to that is that, um, again, I, I happen to live, fortunately live downtown here and it, you know, the riverfront that they did in downtown Columbus is phenomenal. Uh, but we just don't have a culture in America as much as they do in Europe, let's say, of like picnicking and going out. And last year in May, if you walked down the river, it looked like we were in Paris. There were so many picnics. And so if anything, I hope that people um, have recognized the value of these public spaces more and cherished it and said, look, we have these assets here. Uh, you know, let's let's do more of them. Let's embrace more. Let's 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 prioritize creating these kind of things, um, you know, over other kind of things. So. Well, thank you. I think that's a perfect place for us to sort of pause for today's conversation. Um, before we go, I just want to share a few announcements. If today's talk resonated with you and you want to learn more about how you can be one of the leaders who will shape the future of retail, you can check out CCAD's Master of Professional Studies in Retail Design. There's a link there in the chat. This is a new program which is expected, which is, which is launch, launching in January of 2022. Um, and it was shaped by leaders like Brian, who are part of its advisory board for its curriculum and its programming. Um, if you enjoyed today's talk, you can also check out the CCAD Knows Retail website um, for to learn about the other upcoming talks uh, happening now through June. We're looking forward to welcoming experts like Tom Ramsey of Bath and Body Works and Dave Cherry of Cherry Advisory. And if you enjoyed today's lecture and want to share it with a friend who wasn't able to attend, there will be a recording available on that MPS and Retail Design website after May 13th. Um, be sure to stay connected with CCAD by following us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. I would be remiss if I didn't say the lines given to me there. And I want to say thank you so much to Brian and to all of you. And I wish you a really excellent rest of your day. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate your time.